Hi folks, 3D machining, engraving, mold making. Let's have some fun making this ice press. These things are not only really cool, but this ties back to how you can get started with a CNC machining business, which is either making gifts for the people that you know to help spread the word and ply your trade or develop a product and bring it to market. It can be this exact style of an ice mold machine or anything like it. We're using the thermal conductivity properties of aluminum to take a large chunk of ice and shape it into this skull logo. It's a really cool way to take your cocktails to the next level. Having a larger single ice sphere can help reduce the surface area, which can help your ice stay ice longer and not melt and dilute your drink. And if you really want to step up your game, we'll include a link below to some articles on how you can pretty easily make clear ice. We did some quick OD turning and grooving on the manual lathe, both for decoration, but also to help increase the surface area of the aluminum part. We need that thermal conductivity property of aluminum to help wick away and melt the section of the ice cube that we don't want. Aluminum is an excellent thermal conductor. It's incredible how cold just one cube will make our aluminum object. And then we'll move over to the 770. I love keeping this three jaw chuck around. It's easy to mount now on the fixture plate and it's just the right way to hold round parts. I used to use V blocks in a vice jaw and that's okay, but I find you've got more holding power on the three jaw chuck as well as a much larger range of holding area. Drilling a couple holes and then we get into the fun stuff. We're letting 3D Adaptive take care of most of the work using a 3 16 inch Lakeshore end mill at all the RPMs we've got, 10K and 3 thousandths of an inch feed per tooth. The trick here is to adjust your fine step down and on some parts, take a look at machine shallow areas. Checking that box can force the Fusion cam kernel to take a closer look at how to machine certain shallower areas, which can be really helpful when you're doing a semi-finishing operation for surfacing. What do we want here is a really good looking surface. After that, doing another 3D adaptive, the difference here is we have a 1 8 inch ball end mill and we've got rest machining checked to let this serve as our last roughing strategy before we come back with the same tool and do the parallel. The trick with parallel is make use of that add perpendicular passes. The parallel pass direction is relative to your x-axis. And if you're struggling to align that with your work coordinate system, don't forget on it, even on most three axis machines, you can use tool orientation to change that direction of this x-axis to adjust where those lines are going. In case you didn't catch that, let's take a closer look. We've got a rectangular shape, but it's got a corner lopped off of it. The x-axis is in line with these two edges. So when we create a normal parallel toolpath at a zero degree pass direction, those parallel passes will be in line with that x-axis. What if I want the parallel lines to be in line with this axis? Now we could measure that angle, if I hold down the control key and click this other face, Fusion will tell us it's 143.776 degrees. And you could type that in, but there's an easier way. I'll duplicate the operation, right click, edit, and under geometry, I'll choose tool orientation. I could ignore the z-axis, just click on x-axis and this edge right here. Notice my x-axis is now in line with this face. This is, this is how a lot of three plus two work is done. Like if you saw our video on the V8 engine block, a significant portion of those quote unquote five axis cuts were really just reorienting 
uh, in that case, are B and C axes. Here we've updated the X axis. It's worth noting this isn't actually going to move your traditional work coordinate system or G54. You're just realigning a relative axis. So now when I click OK, I've done nothing else, and those parallel toolpaths are now in line with that axis. When you're making those adjustments, it's actually a lot easier to have a larger step over. We'll say just this up to 25 thousandths of an inch. That's going to let you more easily see the lines, and it computes a little bit faster. And this gives you an idea that we're going, in this case, straight up and down and left and right. Or you could adjust that to something like 45 degrees to get a different look. When you're trying to do something like a fake knurling, this is your friend. Use a ball nose end mill with a larger step over. You'll get a really good texture, but that's not what we want here. We want a really good mold surface. So we've got this set at four thousandths of an inch. This next adaptive takes quite a bit of time to compute. I've been sitting here and it's moving at 26%. If you're ever not certain if it's broken or frozen, go up to manage task manager, and you're going to get a much better view of what's going on with that process and elapsed time. There's also some pretty cool things you can do with switching the priority distributed cam, stuff that we haven't gotten into, but nevertheless starts to give you a hint of the power of the cam kernel. If you want to stop it from regenerating, when it's done computing, we're going to right click and choose protect. Very similar cam strategy for the other half of the mold. A little bit easier because we don't have as many features to machine, so a parallel toolpath will get the job done quite well. I was really happy with the surface fit. I thought this thing turned out great. The tooling was great. We had adjusted the run out. The coolant is helping evacuate chips so you're not recutting those chips or wedging any cut chips between your cutting flute and the part and marring that finish. Just really fun. It reminds me why I love machining, the ability to make something and make something pretty cool and it can be a really fun gift. Delicious.